This is my essay on Art in Individual Minds and Public Places, Christo and Jean-Claude Gates. I don't generally write on abstract art because I don't consider it art. But for the sake of those who are curious about the reasons behind that choice, I've lightly edited this essay from 2004. It was written just before the opening of The Gates by Christo and Jean-Claude in New York City Central Park. But before we get to these snarky, exasperated parts, let me tell you the premises I'm working on. Around 1400 BC, an artist at the Palace of Knossos in Crete painted a large fresco of three people and a bull. There is no setting, the background is plain blue. The figures are in outline with little indication of their expressions. Are these three figures leaping over the bull in quick succession, or are we seeing one figure in three different stages? Is it a rite of passage for adolescents, a spectator sport of some kind, or something completely different? In fact, we don't know what's going on here or why. Yet, the posture of the three figures as they confront the huge bull tells us something, that the figures are facing a dangerous adversary and winning with ease and with grace. We know that simply because the artists chose to represent these particular figures in this relationship. In the millennia since that painting, all paintings and sculptures have conveyed some message about man and the world he lives in. Even a mediocre work, such as Seward or Cox, tells you that this particular man and his accomplishments were once honored and considered significant. A great work of art goes far beyond that. It shows the artist's message transformed into an unforgettable image. Such a work is not merely pretty decor. It gives you a guide to living your life. The sight or the memory of it suggests what you should pay attention to and where you should focus amid the chaos of impressions that assaults your senses every minute of every day. At its best, art can literally help you keep your goals in sight. A work of visual art condenses a whole view of the world. You can hold it in your mind as a single concrete image of what sort of person you'd like to become. For example, a person with the courage and pride of Michelangelo's David or the elegance of Madame Recamier. You can use it to recall the sort of world you want to live in, the peace of a constable landscape, the bustle and energy of Canaletto's Venice, the drama of a Delacroix scene. Here's Ayn Rand's explanation of why such art is essential to us. Quote, Since man lives by reshaping his physical background to serve his purpose, since he must first define and then create his values, a rational man needs a concretized projection of these values, an image in whose likeness he will reshape the world and himself. Art gives him that image. End of quote. Bearing that in mind, consider husband and wife team Christo and Jean-Claude's The Gates. New York City officials granted permission for The Gates to stand in Central Park for two weeks during February 2005. The project consisted of 7,503 gates placed 10 to 15 feet apart along 23 miles of pedestrian walkways. Each gate was 16 feet high and had 8 feet of saffron-colored fabric suspended from its crossbar. In 2004, the Metropolitan Museum of Art eagerly anticipating this event, devoted a three-month-long exhibition to the project. What message, what concretized projection of values did the gates convey? None at all. If you examined every fiber of the million square feet of fabric, you wouldn't have been a nanometer closer to knowing what sort of person you'd like to be, what you should focus on, or what sort of world you'd like to live in. Prominent art historians and critics at the Whitney, the Museum of Modern Art, and the New York Times didn't even try to proclaim any meaning in the gates. They merely asserted that it would draw attention to Central Park. Quote, it might work and it's not permanent, so why not give it a shot? Asked the publisher of the New York Observer. 
The 20-year controversy over whether to allow the gates to be erected in Central Park was driven largely by fears of the work's environmental impact. In fact, there was a much more basic reason for rejecting the project, the lack of any impact on the minds of those seeing it. If it conveys no message, it isn't art. And if it isn't art, why allow it in the park? We might just as well grant permission to the picket fences or the discarded taxi bumpers. If you want to enjoy art in Central Park, seek out the dozens of figurative sculptures scattered through the park, from Duke Ellington to the Delacorte clock, from the main monument to Samuel Morse, from Still Hunt to the Untermeyer Fountain. Like genuine works of art for millennia, these have the potential to speak to you, to inspire, provoke, and amuse you in a way that the gates never will. I received so many responses to this essay that I published an exasperated addendum. Many of the dozens of responses were unsubstantiated ad hominem attacks. You are so narrow-minded. Others were emotional rants. Still others were appeals to authority. Who are you to disagree with famous people? None of them affected my opinion of the gates. Here's why. Respect for reality and for other people's minds requires that you attach specific meanings to words rather than spewing out what you kind of, sort of, more or less think you mean. You will have a problem taking a breath if you decide to call a lake a sidewalk and try to saunter across it. You will waste away and die if you decide to call cotton candy a nutritious food and eat nothing but that. And you will eventually have a problem if you call a grandstanding boondoggle such as the Gates art. Art has a nature and a definition. It isn't whatever any self-proclaimed artist produces. If it were, you and I could both be turning out art while watching NCIS. It isn't whatever a museum curator or gallery owner decrees to be art. Otherwise, the ancient Greeks and the Renaissance Italians, for instance, wouldn't have had any art at all, poor dears. Art isn't anything I find pretty or spectacular, either. If it were, Brugmansia plants and giant Pikachu balloons would be art. To repeat what I said before, what separates visual art from other forms of human endeavor is that its creator, by his choice of a recognizable subject and his emphasis in presenting it, conveys a message to his viewers. He says in an image, pay attention, this is important about man and the world. Michelangelo's 500-year-old David makes a statement about what man can and ought to be that we can still grasp and react to. The Gates says nothing. It's as artistic as my bedroom curtains. I don't normally get wrought up about curtains, indoors or out. I wouldn't even have bothered to discuss the gates if it had been erected on a private farm in Idaho. But since it took over Central Park, a magnificently designed public space where many of us couldn't avoid it without serious inconvenience, it annoyed me quite a lot. Letting it pass for art also sets a precedent for allowing other such gargantuan objects in the park, and eventually having the government, which means me and you, pay for them. A proper definition of art would be a big step toward preventing that. If you want to think more about this, I recommend Ayn Rand's The Romantic Manifesto, which deals primarily with literature. I've discussed her definition of art with respect to sculpture and painting in several of my books, Outdoor Monuments of Manhattan, Politics and Portrait Sculptures, Innovators in Sculpture, Getting More Enjoyment from Art You Love, and How to Analyze and Appreciate Paintings. The URL for the original version of this post is at the top of the screen. DianeDurantiWriter.com has hundreds of other posts on sculpture, painting, Central Park, and my many obsessions. I have a free Sunday recommendations list. Uh, I mail out three art-related recommendations every week. To join that, you can go to the URL online or email me at the address there. And you can say, well done, Diane, or support my work on a recurring basis and receive rewards by means of the tip jar on dianedurantywriter.com. Thank you so much for listening.